for the the month, uh, Mimi Pond. Hey guys. So um, I thought I would start out by, um, now let's see. I'm, uh, ah, wait a minute, there it is. Um, sharing with you, um, First, some web comics that I did before I get ramped up and start talking about my current um, project. Actually, I found that um, I started doing web comics um, in, uh, let's see, uh, about 2014. Um, the first one I did, I um, just put on my own website. Um, and I wish I'd sold it somewhere because it's really a strange story. Um, can you all see this now? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, so this was uh, called A Squeak from the Void and I'll, I'm just gonna read it for you. I got an excited phone call from my friend and fellow cartoonist, Vanessa Davis. There's a hamster show in Griffith Park this weekend. We're going. <clears throat> this is a not unexpected occurrence when you lead the cartoonist lifestyle. So it was Vanessa, her cartoonist boyfriend, Trevor Alexopoulos, my 17-year-old comic genius daughter, Lulu, and me. This is going to be great. Spirits were high. Let's see. Uh, I was sure it would look like this. Why wouldn't people throng? We arrived at the posted address. This is it. Then, look. This was it. The show had started at 9 a.m. It was now 11 a.m. She'd been at it for two hours already. The hamster lady was full of hamster facts. A dwarf hamster should ideally be completely round like a ball. It couldn't be denied. Syrian hamsters are notoriously antisocial. She looked exactly like a hamster. There was something poignant about someone passionate about a, a subject few people get really excited about. Good hamsters and bad hamsters can be found in every city. My mind wandered. I began to <clears throat> imagine the hamster lady's apartment tonight on Animal Planet. Her interactions, yes. Uh, <laughs> hi, listen, there, there, have been, there have been some complaints. Complaints? About a smell. Maybe her social life? I'm documenting color genetics of Campbell's, Campbell's dwarf hamsters. I just remembered I have to be somewhere. But the longer we all stood there in the chilly wind and tried to appear interested, the more sad and lonely the scene became. Two of the criteria for show hamsters are size and temperament. The hamster lady had about her a deeply melancholy, <clears throat> melancholy air. In the fun category, mellowest goes to teddy bear Syrian number six. We all sensed it. We snuck out while her back was turned. Where did I put those third place rosettes? We came because we thought a hamster show would be fun. We hadn't come to make fun of hamsters or the people who love them. But now we were in the throes of a profound exist existential angst. Hamsters are just funny. A woman who Looks like a hamster who raises hamsters. That should be funny, right? A woman whose life is devoted to hamsters. She will haunt our dreams. <laughs> so that's that one. Um, I mean, this thing, this just like begged to be a cartoon. And then, um, let's see, I did. Uh, I did a cartoon for um, about the um, Turner Classic Movies um, Film Festival, which happens <clears throat> in Hollywood every year. It's been going on for like, I guess, well, it had at that point been going on for like eight or nine years. And um, it was, it was uh, really fun. So I'll read this one and then we can talk about making comics and stuff. Ready for our close-up, the 2017 TCM <clears throat> Classic Film Festival. 
In Los Angeles, California, tourists clocked up, flocked to Hollywood Boulevard thinking they're gonna see Hollywood. The powers that be thought that they could gentrify the long seedy strip by building a giant mall next to Grauman's man's, the TCL Chinese theater. They even included an homage to D.W. Griffith's landmark silent film, Intolerance. I don't think anyone here gets the reference. The Hollywood and Highland Center also houses the Kodak Dol Dolby Theater, new home to the Academy Awards. Oh my God, Brittany, look, there's a Sephora. I think, that's, I think it's depressing to have the Oscars in a shopping mall. Back out on Hollywood Boulevard, it's still a tawdry carnival of souls. There's no Hollywood here. But across the street for four days out of the year inside the Hollywood Roosevelt Hotel, it's a different story. 25,000 movie fans gather here at Turner Classic Movie Network's TCM Classic Film Festival to enjoy over 80 movies and dozens of events and appearances by Hollywood luminaries and yes, actual stars. It's like they vacuumed up all the audiences of every art house theater in the country and emptied the bag out here. Excuse me, but the third man is not noir. Oh boy, it, huh? It lacks moral ambiguity and it's got no femme fatale. These are passionate film buffs. The festival has been running for eight years. People return year after year from all over and form close friendships. Really, think, <clears throat> really I think all noir movies should just be called stupid men movies. Amen, sister. I definitely get the feeling they don't have anyone back home they can share that stuff with. The feeling here is cozy and inclusive. Young or old, everyone's opinion is valid. Speaking of noir, I think Barbara Stanwyck in Double Indemnity wins for worst movie wig. Dude, no, that'd be Jackie Cooper in Treasure Island. The kickoff event at the festival is a tribute to the much beloved recently deceased TCM host, Robert Osborne. Another host, Ben Mankiewicz calls him the Walter Cronkite of the network. Others from the TCM family share more personal stories. He was obsessed with Judge Judy. He had an infectious giggle like a little girl's. Once he didn't speak to Esther Williams for a whole year. He hated beach movies, monster movies, and Elvis movies. Oh, when it was Elvis week, Robert had the flu. The things you learn. Where else but here could you see Martin Scorsese introduce a nitrate print of Hitchcock's The Man Who Knew Too Much from 1934? <clears throat> I love talking about celluloid nitrate. Yes, it's flammable. Yes, it blows up, but it has a luminosity. He's right. With our 60-inch 60, 60 screens at home and our phones and our tablets, we some, <clears throat> sometimes forget the communion of the theater, theater-going experience. It's like church without the damnation. We are those wonderful people out there in the dark. They even have nightly poolside sc screenings at the Hollywood Roosevelt, like whatever happened to baby Jane. But you are, Blanche, you are in that chair. They don't really let people get in the pool during movies. The TCM host Ben Mankiewicz interviews director Peter Bogdanovich. Peter Bogdanovich, and I'm so close. He has a million juicy stories. Van Orson said to me, you can't gain weight if no one sees you eating. I once, I met Cary Grant once and all I could think was, he looks just like Cary Grant. And finally, Jimmy Stewart once told me, you're giving people little tiny pieces of time that they'll never forget. Sigh. From there, I go to see an obscure Robert Donat film, Donat film from 1951, The Magic Box. Leonard Maltin introduces it. How about a little trivia quiz here? Who beat out Clark Gable, Jimmy Stewart, Laurence Olivier and Mickey Rooney for the 1940 Best Ask Actor Oscar. Robert Donat! Usually by the last day of any festival, it's down to the dregs by the late afternoon. <clears throat> Not here, the closing party, which doesn't even begin till 9 p.m. is packed. I'm telling you, it was positively Chandler-esque. You look like Franklin Pangborn. Really? When I ask young Rachel what part of Tennessee she's from, she says, you know the movie Sergeant York with Gary Cooper? I'm from where J Sergeant York's from. The lead Oompa Loompa from the 1970s Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory is schmoozing in the corner. He introduced the film here, shown poolside, and almost jumped in. In a corner of the party is a case displaying Debbie Reynolds' dress from Singing in the Rain. Suddenly I have company. It's two siblings who look like Jane and Michael Banks. They're pouring over the costume like forensic cinema scientists. Look, it's the movie still from Singing in the Rain. 
The shoes in the picture aren't the same as these. They have no T-strap and they've got bows. She's right. When I look up again, <clears throat> those junior cineasts are gone. It's like a dream, or is it a dream sequence? I wind up sitting with 80-year-old Zilla from Baltimore. I ask her what movies mean to her. My husband and I were huge movie fans. So when he died four years ago, everyone asked, what goes on the tombstone? Pudapu day. Do you know what that's from? I'm speechless. The, the producers, the Swedish secretary. All the non-Jews at the funeral thought Pudapu Day was Hebrew. Scylla, you are hardcore. Then I realized everyone here is hardcore. So anyway, that, you know, it's, it's, it's really fun to, um, you know, sort of become a, a uh, journalist and collect all this information and try to figure out what to do with it. Um, and actually from there, I, uh, <clears throat> what I should do is talk about the following year when I went back to the TCM Film Festival, uh, not to do another cartoon about it, but um, it happened to be around the same time, oops, that's not right, um, that, uh, there was, <clears throat> had been an, um, an auction uh, for uh, Zsa Zsa Gabor's estate um, that I went to. And <clears throat> I don't know if you guys have this, this happen to you, but sometimes <clears throat> as a cartoonist, you walk into situations and it's just like someone has presented you with an enormous gift, a beautiful, beautiful, br brightly wrapped, sparkly ribboned, gift that's just yours to open and play with as you want. And this was this was exactly what happened with, <clears throat> with this. And <clears throat> I did this for the LA Times, <clears throat> excuse me, back in uh, 2018. Uh, long before there were Kardashians, there was Zsa Zsa Gabor in Darling. Zsa Zsa was a true pioneer of fame for fame's sake. She should have won a Guinness Records title for most famous for no goddamn reason. Even after she went on trial in 1989 for slapping a traffic cop, people cheered for her. She captured the rich and famous zeitgeist, chandeliers, diamonds, multiple husbands, furs, Rolls Royce, gold-plated crap. She was the placeholder for the average person's idea of this. If they couldn't do it, she'd do it for them. And by rich and famous, I mean cartoon rich and famous. She died at age 99 in 2016, having squeezed every last darling out of life, leaving her ninth and final husband, the German Frederick Prince von Anhalt, as the sole trustee of her estate. She was so beautiful. He's 26 years younger. More on him later. <clears throat> the auction preview of her estate was at her home in Bel Air. Do you really think I'd miss that? Curious fans mill about. She sure did like pictures of herself marveling at it all. Oh, her last mascara. I find myself chatting with a woman as we admire the Barbie <clears throat> dream house daybed. That's what I called it. You know, it was sad the way her daughter died. I know. Zsa Zsa's only child, Francesca Hilton, died in 2015 of a stroke at age 67. They had been estranged. Did you know she died in the bathroom at Norm's? No, I didn't. The one on the yeah, the one on La Cienega. It's a nasty norms, but I like it. It's a chain of <clears throat> coffee shops here in LA. <clears throat> this is when I noticed the needlepoint pillows on the bed. Mother, another word for love. And my dog is my baby. Zsa Zsa's husband is nearby swanning <clears throat> for the camera crew. Every time someone comes to the house, Zsa Zsa had to open champagne. Every time. He's really selling it. In 1984, former <clears throat> businessman, it's vague, <clears throat> 26 years her junior, Frederick Prince von Anhalt, bought himself a bogus royal title and gate crashed his way into Hollywood. Yeah, it's the only gold-plated piano in the world. Actually, gold leaf. Come on, man. He mingles with delighted auction pre previewers. So many suitcases. Yeah, she only put one dress in a suitcase. Really? Which one did you carry? The one with all the jewelry? She didn't want to squash anything. Yeah, ha, ha, yeah, the one with all the jewelry. Later, Frederick recounts how he met Zsa Zsa. Yeah, I crashed a party at Sydney Sheldon's. I was wearing all this military regalia. You got to impress them. 
And Sidney Sheldon says, oh, so nice to see you again, your Royal Highness. Oops, where was I? Oh, sorry. <clears throat> they didn't know me from nothing. Not the first time he's told this story. <clears throat> he claims Zsa, Zsa. <clears throat> I'm so sorry. <clears throat> Far from being repelled, was enchanted by his moxie. She said, well, if he could do that, what else can he do? They stayed married for 30 years. Maybe it was a mutually agreed upon fable, like a 1930s Lubitsch comedy set in 19th century Middle, Europe, Middle Europa. Yeah, you see, there's a military regalia. Or maybe it was more like a Billy Wilder movie. What about the time in 20, 20, <clears throat> uh, 2007 when you claimed you were robbed, stripped naked, and handcuffed to the steering wheel of your Rolls Royce? When someone puts a gun to your head, what will you do? Oddly, according to media reports, he was able to call the police on his cell phone. No handcuffs were found at the scene, but he was naked. He tells me his plans for the future. Yeah, I'm going to run for governor of California. Also not true. I'm going to be on the ballot. I don't know much about politics, but I talk about Hollywood. People like that. He's been talking in cotton candy circles in a streusel-laden accent. I'm accent. I'm addled by all the malarkey mit schlag. Where will you go after this? After this? To the Vilsha Corridor. Crappy 80s couch also for sale. <clears throat> he says it like it's an independent city state and not just some Beverly Hills adjacent high rises. I love this country. In America, you can do anything. People here are so gullible. What about you claiming also in 20... 2007 to be the father of the late Anna Nicole Smith's infant daughter. You know that baby and her father, they should thank me. Because of me, they, they did the DNA. Now she has a family. A couple of weeks later, Jaja's auction has grossed $909,209 and I'm still struggling to make sense of it. I'm at the Turner Classic Movies Film Festival when someone tells me, you didn't know? The prince is having a garage sale of the rest of Jaja's stuff on Saturday. What? Kaboom! Yes, the prince was there taking people's cash as they milled about the house. Yeah, that's $500. Look at all that workmanship. Now looking truly shabby and pillaged. The dregs of the auction were all that was left. A shih tzu figurine, an electric walk, a jokey prince pillow. I snuck upstairs, I sneaked upstairs to the Moulin Rouge room where Zsa, Zsa used to have her parties. There's a disco ball and a bar and a dance floor. It was empty and sad. Empty except for these left on the bar. It says happy birthday, Zsa, Zsa Little party hats. Back downstairs, the prince was still working his brand of chicanery. <clears throat> I've got $300 to spend and that's all. She's trying to be all hardball. Yeah, give me $400 for the whole lot. Okay, totally caved. At the end of her life, is this what it all comes down to? Fake Oscar that says best person. Later that same day, back down in Hollywood at the Turner Classic Movies Film Festival, I watched Billy Wilder's Sunset Boulevard. The dream she'd so desperately clung to had it enfolded her. I clutched the arm of the man sitting next to me. <gasps> it's just like Zsa, Zsa Okay, maybe I had Zsa, Zsa on the brain, but as I left the Chinese theater, who started I see on the Walk of Fame directly in front of it? Shasha Gabor, it was a sign. Shasha basked unapologetically in her own megalomania, which seems innocent now. It wasn't like I was trying to destroy democracy, darling. She was a greedy and talentless narcissist, but she symbolized glamor and excitement to millions, all striving to find their own inner Shasha. Hello, darling. Hello, darling. Hello, darling. Hello, darling. Hello, darling. And so on. Anyway, that's the end. So yes, yeah, some, some situations are just a gift to a cartoonist. And uh, other times, you know, it's really hard and you have to struggle. Um, I will go back to the beginning. Um, <clears throat> I'm working on a graphic, uh, I guess you call it a, a work of graphic nonfiction, which is a mouthful. Um, uh, it's a comic book about the Mitford sisters, and I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Mitford sisters, but there were six English aristocratic sisters who were born between uh, 1904 and 1920, who um, were kind of uh, 
never given a formal education. They were they were educated at home by by uh, governesses and tutors. <clears throat> Their father didn't believe in educating girls. Uh, he had in, inherited. Uh, um, he, he was a, a baron. He had inherited the title when his older brother was killed in World War I, and uh, he was completely unequipped to uh, be a baron or to manage a large estate, and he had probably the worst business sense of anyone you've ever seen, and he kept telling his daughters there was no money for them while he was busy sending them into the ground, and they, they, kind of, they all started to form their exit strategies very early. Um, and they uh, each, uh, they basically uh, all went and did a whole bunch of stuff they shouldn't have done. And uh, they've always fascinated me. Uh, the oldest was Nancy, who was, um, let's see, actually, um, I'll go, where did they go? Um, well, you're doing a particularly interesting uh, blue shade line drawing art on this, too. It's uh, very unusual. Oh, thanks. Um, there was, anyway, the, the, the Nancy was the first. <clears throat> she uh, became a, a um, comic novelist and became very successful. And then the second sister was uh, Pamela, who was actually the, the um, anomaly in that she was the quiet country sister who um, stayed at home. They had a brother named Tom who wisely stayed out of all the arguments. He unfortunately died in World War II. But then there was uh, Diana who um, was desperate to get out of the house and <clears throat> married, um, Ryan Guinness, who was the heir to the enormous beer fortune, but she left him for um, Sir Oswald Mosley, who was the head of the British Union of Fascists, and they became uh, uh, devout fascists and followers of, of Hitler, and Oswald Mosley basically wanted to, to bring fascism to uh, Britain, and um, then there's Unity, who became an even more fanatical uh, fascist and successfully stalked Hitler in Munich and <clears throat> like became oddly, uh, had a, an oddly very close relationship to him. Um, and when when Britain declared war, war on, on Germany in 1939, she went to a park in Munich and shot herself in the head, uh, but she only incurred brain damage and was taken back home where she was cared for for the rest of her life by her mother. And then there was uh, Jessica, who was uh, the uh, Unity's uh, polar opposite and declared herself to be a communist and ran off to the Spanish Civil War with her cousin, who she later eloped with, um, and went on to become a, a brilliant muckraking journalist uh, and, and best-selling author. And then the last sister was uh, Deborah, who um, married the younger son of a duke. And of course, um, his older brother uh, died in World War II. So she and he became the Duke and Duchess of Devonshire and um, staggeringly wealthy. <laughs> oh, Mimi, do you have any of the art from this project? Yes, I do. I would, I would I just, love to see yes. it. I actually, so here's, here's, um, I just wanted to talk about some of my influences because when I started working on this project, I just said, I want to do, you know, this has like been my hobby for years. I have like, you know, huge stacks of books I've read about them. And, and um, my husband was getting annoyed with me by boring everyone at parties by talking in the way I've just been talking for the last 10 minutes about them. <laughs> And this we is, want to see the is like, is what we I know, I know. This is like the, the winnowed down version that I've, <laughs> <laughs> this is the elevator pitch. So I was like, I don't know what this is going to look like. I have no idea what this should look like. And I started looking, uh, I, I formed a, a Pinterest board, which I heartily recommend for gathering images to inspire yourself. Um, I started, first, I just started looking at pictures of English illustrations of that period. Everyone from uh, Kenneth Graham's, um, Wind in the Willows, which was illustrated by, um, um, of course, I'm missing his name. He also illustrated yeah. Winnie the Pooh. Um, 
Shepard, thank you. And, and also his daughter, uh, Mary Shepard illustrated um, Mary Poppins. <clears throat> and I discovered another really delightful uh, English illustrator whose name is Edward Artizone, uh, whose work is really charming. And um, that kind of started to lead me down the garden path. And this actually, this illustration, I, you know, if you're going to steal, you've got to steal from the best. So I did. Uh, this was, this was a page I did. I'm kind of interweaving my own story into this Mitford book because it's so personal. So this is, this is just a page about my own childhood. And then I discovered um, a book jacket um, uh, uh, that uh, has uh, a collection of essays. Uh, one of them is, is uh, by Nancy Mitford. Uh, it's called Noblesse Oblige. And um, this kind of like just kicked it off. I was like, yeah. Like that. Some interesting projects. Yeah. Um, and um, so that inspired this illustration. So this was this is yeah. at the beginning of the book. So here's all the sisters. There's Nancy, Pam, Diana, Unity, Jessica, and Deborah. And then I just find like like random images that that excited me. So when I was doing a page about how um, Diana Mitford met Oswald Mosley at a dinner party and they like had this instant attraction to one another, that seemed to work really well. Oh, <clears throat> and um, they, they used to, Unity was a really strange person, very eccentric and her sisters described her. She, she um, was also an artist and she was very interested in artists like William Blake. And <clears throat> so I thought, you know, I'd do a page about her in a kind of William Blake Ooh. manner. And um, then I discovered this artist, Rex Whistler, who is just the most fabulous. Okay fantastic artist and and unfortunately he he uh enlisted in world war ii and i mean he was a brilliant artist he did murals he did illustration he did beautiful paintings <clears throat> he was spectacularly talented and he joined a tank unit and went to france and popped his head out of a tank and pew, just gone just woof, just fabulous waste and uh, then I saw this and I just like, wow, that's amazing. And um, also this. So when uh, Jessica, middle, uh, okay. Mimi, um, you were mentioning that you put together a Pinterest collection of resources you find online? Yes. And um, yeah, so I, I had, I'm sorry, I had, uh, hang on I saw this and then I saw this and uh without the swastikas <laughs> and it led to this. badly drawn swastikas yeah you know I have a really hard problem drawing swastikas because I can never remember if they go clockwise or counterclockwise they go either way depending on if they're male or female so don't worry about it <laughs> <laughs> or or Hindu or Nazi well, um, they're no, they're they're both Hindu. It's just that we've allowed the Nazis to culturally appropriate something that doesn't belong to them. Yes, um, and they're ruined forever. <laughs> no, they're not. We're going to take them back. I Schmuck know should not that's... be allowed to keep stuff. I know. I just don't know if that's really um, anyway. Uh, because because um, Jessica Mitford and her husband were such staunch. Um, well, they were they were so anti-fascist that they were like they didn't even think the Communist Party really went far enough. Uh, but they were big supporters of of uh, Russia. So I I found this image and made this. Ooh, so that was fun. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> you know, there's I, I've had to do a, a great deal of re research, and I've learned more about World War II than I ever thought I would. Uh, I've also learned that um, uh, World War II, like uh, baseball and and the Beach Boys and rock and roll, seem to to uh, be topics that that middle aged men think that they and only they are are experts on. <laughs> it's it's very odd that they, they get really angry if you start to, you know, express an opinion about any of those things. But uh, it's it's been I mean you know I went to art school so I'm like backing my ass into history at this late date, 
<clears throat> and really enjoying it. So uh, part of the story, of course, I mean, it, uh, uh, the the story spans from, you know, uh, pre-World War One all the way up to mm -hmm. like the, actually, uh, Deborah was the, the last sister who died in 2014. So it's, it's a, you know, it spans a great deal of, <clears throat> of time. And um, uh, I was learning about uh, the Battle of Dunkirk, and <clears throat> it's hard to find very many pictures of Dunkirk because I guess they were just too busy fighting. But some soldier made this drawing of the of the battle from a ship, which is incredible. And then, of course, they made a movie about Dunkirk in the 1950s called Dunkirk. And so I I kind of uh, Jerry rigged both of those images into, well, this is a sketch just to give you an idea of my process. It's, <clears throat> I, I tend to scribble on the backs of scrap paper and try to get like, oh. you know, an, an image going. And then <clears throat> here's the only thing I do that's, that's on the computer is I will scan it and um, uh, play with watercolor on top of it and see if I like it and then go back and start it and slowly add in more tone until I get to the finish. <clears throat> and this is the finish. Um, so uh, also um, uh, vintage movie titles are another big influence um, in terms of using typography and comic pages. They're, they're, I find um, movie, <clears throat> movie titles, uh, which are abundant on Pinterest um, to be, I have a whole, section just on on movie inspirations for for this so that was that was fun um oh so i thought i had more of the mitford pages up here but i can don't worry i can find them to share more i, I just wanted to share this with you um because speaking of of uh sudden inspiration um i um i was at i guess it was last Yes, it was about this time last year that I, um, in the midst of, of the quarantine <clears throat> and we weren't going shopping and all I was doing was ordering things from, from Instacart. And I really love to cook and I like shopping for my own food and cooking, but you know, you like trying to do the best with what you've got. And <clears throat> this just, uh, this whole cartoon came together with the first bite of, of a ham sandwich. And I'll, I'll just run through this fast and I'll get back to the Mitfords. Um, it was called What in Ham Nation? It was for the, the, New, the New Yorker uh, online. And uh, I can tell you all that it's really fun to be able to tell people that you're in the New Yorker, but that um, the truth of the matter is, is that they pay horribly. And it's, it's, um, it's really awful. And it's a, they should be ashamed of themselves for what they pay for their online content. Um, I don't know if any of you have had that experience of working with them. They're very nice, but they like they pay you three hundred dollars for something that if it was in the magazine, they would pay a lot, a lot of money for. And uh, it's just not fair. All right. So my rant's over. I'm going to read this to you. Uh, shopping and meal planning during quarantine are tricky, but I don't have Chinese five spice powder. How about ketchup instead? You can't always get what you need. Sometimes you have to wing it. Tired of cooking and eating the same old things? Oh, and it's on sale. Impul impulsively, I ordered a spiral sliced ham from Costco. Even though I knew the old joke, <clears throat> two people plus a ham equals eternity, <laughs> time space continuum. Uh, even so, when it arrived, I was shocked by its size. Not really, but would we ever finish it? Anyway, the first thing I did was make ham sandwiches. Mmm. I know a lot of ways to cook with ham. Ham and eggs, ham and beans, ham and cheese, omelets, ham and pasta, ham and bean soup, ham biscuit. But it seemed like instead of getting smaller, I can't get it in the fridge anymore. The ham was growing. I won't lie, the ham became very demanding. It wanted to watch TV all the time. But the new Oliver Sacks doc, <laughs> no. But then it started blur blaring OAN all day. Oh, Democrats want to eat your babies. We couldn't eat it down. We couldn't argue it down. Yes, he was legally elected. You don't know that. It was a good thing we couldn't have anyone over. Oh, out in the libs. The ham was embarrassing us. We tried giving some of it away to the neighbors. Uh, thanks, but we're not really ham people. 
Pat, get away from the door. When had be being a ham person become a bad thing? I had to be careful to keep it away from the computer. Are you sure you changed all the passwords? I, I think. We think it was going online after we went to bed. The FBI finally showed up. Freeze! Thank God you're here. It turned out the ham had been at the Capitol riot. Oh! Honestly, how could you not know? Wait, before you, can I make you guys a sandwich before you go? So that was that. Speaking of uh, horrible things like that, I'm trying to find out what happened to, oh, here we go. Here it is, here, here. Okay, so back to the Mitfords. Um, this was a, um, <clears throat> you know, it's like trying to acquaint my readers with who the Mitfords were. And um, actually Rex Whistler, um, no, sorry. Uh, anyway, it starts with Nancy and gives you information about Nancy. And uh, then there's Pamela and just got off. <clears throat> I, I became obsessed with, um, with these kind of frames around things which are have a name that I can never remember. It starts with a C. Uh, and then there's Diana. And this is, this is uh, one of those things. <laughs> My brain is like, ah. um, but um, it just, I, it's kind of like they, they had a kind of Baroque feeling about them and they're, <clears throat> I chose to use them because they're uh, being aristocrats. They come from this whole, uh, you know, kind of Baroque sensibility of fancy life that I kind of imagined as a child. And, and I kind of like did a deep dive and I'm reading this, book right now that's like the size of a doorstop that's called uh, the, the Decline and Fall of the British Aristocracy and it's just blowing my mind. So anyway, here's, here's Unity. And then there's Jessica. She's got the hammer and sickle and all kinds of other stuff like that. And then there's Deborah and she became the Duchess. So she's got, it's um, <clears throat> Chatsworth is one of the home, one of the homes of the Duke and Duchess of Devonshire. And I was fortunate enough to be able to tour it when I went to England to do more research. And I also um, was fortunate enough to tour it with Jessica Mitford's son, whose name is Ben Truhoft. And he, um, they, she and her second husband wound up in uh, Oakland and Berkeley. And um, I made a connection with him through uh, another woman who was, writes about the Mitfords. And because I'd done my graphic novels over easy and the customer is always wrong about Mama's Royal Cafe in Oakland, he knew about that and was immediately warm to the idea of meeting. And he was so kind and generous. And he, he took uh, my friend and I, um, we met him at a train station in Coventry where he lives and he, we, we took the train up to <clears throat> the closest train station to, to um, uh, Chatsworth, which is in Devon, Devonshire. Um, and it's, it's like, I don't know, I've never been to Versailles, but Versailles can just go fuck itself because this was like jam packed with zillions of dollars worth of art. And it just like, you know, it's really amazing. And at the same time, you're like, how did all these aristocrats get all this money and keep it for so long? What is wrong with these people? <laughs> anyway, um, here's another Rex Whistler illustration that um, inspired uh, this page, which was about how Nancy Mitford unfortunately devoted like five years of her life to uh, a boyfriend who was, who was gay. <laughs> and who is never gonna not be gay. Um, and um, here's a 1930s radio, which relates to the story of how um, Diana <clears throat> Mitford had left her husband um, scandalously for Oswald Mosley and um, was making a lot of trips to, to Germany to meet with Hitler to try to convince him to sell her a radio license. In Britain, there was only the, the, the uh, nationally owned uh, radio st uh, stations, the, the BBC, and um, she was 
they were trying to get a, a radio license so they could broadcast from Germany to Britain. Uh, and it was supposedly, you know, not supposed to be propaganda, but you're like, yeah, come on. <laughs> uh, and then I had a lot of fun talking about um, Diana's uh, boyfriend, Oswald Mosley, and his relationship with his uh, two sisters-in-law. Um, I won't get into that because it's, uh, it's just too much to go into. Uh, but she and uh, Oswald Mosley finally wound up getting married in Joseph Goebbels' living room with Hitler as a witness, which is pretty staggering. The thing about the Mitford sisters is they like they they knew everyone and they went everywhere and they were just like zelig like in their 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 span across uh, across world history. They just astonish me. Um, so. <clears throat> Again, with, with movie influences, uh, movie posters can be really fun. So uh, like I said, um, Unity Mitford uh, was living in Munich and um, just being like Hitler's full-time imaginary friend. <laughs> and it was like they were both each other's imaginary friends in this really odd way, very odd. Because they did, they did not really have, people want to say they had a sexual relationship. They didn't have a sexual relationship that was like, she could talk to him the way no one else would. Everyone else was kissing his ass night and day and she was just very blunt and brusque and funny. And, and they shared this sense of humor, <laughs> believe it or not. Um, so when she was extremely distraught when Britain finally declared war on, on Germany in September, 1939. So she, she, she had a gun, <clears throat> she bought a gun and she took it to a park in Munich and she mm -hmm. shot herself in the head. Goodness. And then she, you know, she was brain damaged, and um, that led me to think of her staggering around back at home with her mother in the village of Swinbrook, uh, and so that led to this. And uh, what's next? Oh yeah. Um, I saw this, and this is Carol Lombard, um, and I don't know what the movie was, but she, Carol Lombard strongly resembles Diana Mitford, who is like insanely beautiful, and that inspired me to do this. So there's just a, you know a whole lot uh, happening with the Mitfords. Um, do you want to hear more about the Mitfords or uh, about my other web comics? I won't be heard either way. Well, the more the merrier. So uh, this is fascinating, but obviously we, it's cool to hear what else you're working on. Okay. Um, well, I can, I, I don't know how many of you saw the um, um, cartoon that I got the, um, what should I call it, award for? What's the, oh, the, oh my God. <laughs> Uh, Comic Con award that they hand out. Help me, um, Eisner. Ink pot Eisner. I got I got an ink pot and I got an Eisner. Um, but uh, the Eisner was for a car a web comic that was initially um, published online, but then was um, picked up by a anthology of women's co comics about menopause and. <clears throat> Uh, this so it was published in a book, so um, it was nominated, and then my uh, my story won. So uh, this is it. Today only women's carnival. Wow, a carnival just for us. Funny, I haven't heard anyone talking about this. I don't know, Mom. Don't be so paranoid. Let's do it. Here we go. Tunnel of love. This is so corny. This is fun. It's funny. The water's red. Are are, are we sinking? We've stopped, no more red water. I guess we have to walk out to some ride. Well, it's so bright out here. Mom, you look different. I do? How? Hey, look, it's a fun house. These fun house mirrors are hilarious. How come you don't look different? I'm not even in this one. Woo, I'm invisible. The mood swing. I never loved your father. I love your father so much. 
That one wasn't even fun. Who said it was supposed to be? Oh, look, I always like shooting those ducks. Those aren't ducks, those, they're dicks. That's right, eat lead. Who's sorry now, Mr. Johnson? Oh, pinball. Mom, is this how it works? Oh, pretty much. The hormone scrambler. Is this some kind of metaphor? Midway, freak show. A freak show? It's so politically incorrect. The woman who still wears the same size pants she did in high school. The woman who asked for a raise and got it. The woman who almost got elected president. So fake. Ladies, he actually said he was sorry. His name was Gary. Here, the story of the woman who confronted her coworker. Now, wait, can I buy that? Come see the world's angriest women. See them give full vent to years of pent up rage. See how their fury is, how fury is harnessed to a generator powering this entire carnival. Yes, mom. Yes, for only 75 cents. That's how much a woman makes to every man's dollar. See for yourself. Is it hormones or is it just righteously justified rage? You be the judge. Take my money. Everything I'd say, they'd repeat and take credit. I realized my only value was as an object. They said women weren't funny. My husband mispronounces words just to annoy me. Who's invisible now? They're pretty convincing. They have so much power. One of us, one of us, we accept you. We accept you, one of us. They're talking to you, mom. Mom? I've internalized myself, making myself smaller and lesser for too long. Whoa, Dalek, mom, it's not that bad. Yes, it is. I'm not coming home. Tell your father there's a casserole in the, fuck that. I'm running away with this circus. One day you will too. And that's that one. So children, what would you like to hear next? <laughs> oh. How are you going to top that? Oh, it's a cartouche. <laughs> That's what it's called, cartouche. Cartouche. <laughs> Phew. I could, uh, let's see. I could take questions. Oh, definitely. If that's a case, I'll turn off the screen share. OK. Hey, that was that was really great. Oh, thanks. So questions. <laughs> OK. Cool. Who's first? I think everybody's oh, yeah. a little oh, sorry. flabbergasted. Yeah, sorry for missing you there. Hi, um, that was great. Thank you, Mimi. Um, mm -hmm. I loved especially your first two reportage stories where you're kind of, or there were three actually, where you're going to these places where people have these really intense specialized interests. And um, I love that, that theme running through those. Um, and then, uh, as, and I loved your voice acting also, it was oh, great. <laughs> Um, but so historical research and graphic novels is something I do. Yeah. And I, I kind of need to know, like, how do you, when you get into research, how do you figure out where to stop and how to rein it in? Oh man, that's a, that's a really good question. It's hard, especially there's six of them, six sisters and six, like really insanely dramatic well five insanely dramatic stories uh pam's was not quite as dramatic um although she did marry a um a rocket scientist slash steeplechase jockey who um although had fat he had fascist sympathies joined the the um royal canadian i mean he joined the the royal air force and was in the war um he also was openly bisexual so 
you know, even even with the mildest Mitford, there's some kind of kink going on. Oh, she later she later shacked up with a, an Italian uh, uh, equestrian <laughs> woman, <laughs> and and her sisters were never quite sure what the relationship was. And uh, uh, Jessica said, uh, um, "I think she's a you know what being." <laughs> anyway, so reining it in. Um, I mean, I've I've learned the story about them backwards and forwards from reading so many books by them and about them. So you kind of have to like winnow it down to like what's most important. There's a lot more details and a lot more stories, but you just kind of have to try to focus on the most critical parts of it. And, and the, the things, they're not only the most critical and the most important, but also the most fun. Um, and, and it's, I, I mean, I'll just show you what I, I work on, on scrap paper and I just start like writing down, making a list. Uh, I know you can't read this, but like I make a list of, of the things that are going on. And then I think about, um, I, I, I have, I spend a lot of time just thinking about what's going on at that, you know, like 1939, 1940, for example, and go, okay, here's what needs to happen. And the, or, you know, kind of put it in order. And, and then at that point you're like, well, okay, what does it look like? And that's when I start just looking around on Pinterest at different things. And it could be like, it could be very specific or it just could be like random. Um, and the great thing about Pinterest is that, you know, you click on an image and you click, you click on it and it shows you things that are similar and it leads you down these rabbit holes to other images that you didn't even know existed. And maybe you find something, sometimes you don't, but it's kind of, you're just like, uh, you know, like dragging the river of art for inspiration. Um, and it's, yeah, it's, it's, um, some things immediately suggest images, some things don't, but, uh, and, and then some things are like, you, you, you just wanna show the pure emotion of it. There was uh, Jessica and uh, her first husband had a baby that died at four months in a measles outbreak in London. And um, I just had a single image of a, a crib uh, in an empty room with the window open and the crib is empty. Uh, and it's, you know, it, it's all you need to express that kind of feeling of loss. And then, uh, so sometimes you're just like thinking about what's the best way to show the emotion of the scene. And other, other times it's just like, it's very, instead it's very literal and it's like, you know, a real like basic frame by frame comic strip kind of thing. Uh, it just depends on, on you know the, the weight of the emotion and the amount of information you need to get across. There was a, a panel about, um, I mean, I could actually do this easier by sharing my Medford pages. Should I do that sure. and talk about yeah. it? Okay, let's, let's see um, if I can find, oh, there we go. Uh, no, that's that's not the one. Um, um, new share. Okay, share. Oh. All right. um, this is still <clears throat> this is still showing me my old file, and I don't know how to get to. Wait. Oh wait, and shift. Bill, you want to give her a hand there with the uh, with the Zoom? Uh, the problem is navigating on her own computer uh, file, I think. Okay, wait. Let me uh, let me try it again. Um, hang on. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, great. I should do it. 
here, let me um, see if I can make this work. Do, 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 do. Oh. Okay. Can you see that? Yes. Okay. Uh, all right. So yeah, th this is the, the pay. And then, um, you know, there's this like crushing grief. And I think like, you know, what does that look like? It kind of, for me, it kind of looks like that. And then, you know, you pull back, they, they, after the baby's funeral, they left London and they went to uh, Corsica. Um, and I thought, well, what's the best way to show that? And like, you know, from a distance, they're like, they're just tiny people on a, on a beach because they're, you know, their grief is powerful. And then, okay, here's an example, like uh, where you have, I mean, I'm talking about trying to condense a huge amount of information. I was trying to figure out how to tell about um, the um, <clears throat> uh, Neville Chamberlain, who was the, the prime minister went and met with Hitler in uh, 1938 um, to, for a, a peace settlement that was just complete garbage. And <clears throat> it's a, you know, there's a whole lot of more facts about it, but I was just like, how can I get all this, you know, I, I don't like to use a lot of words per page and there's no way to get around it with this. And I just thought uh, like, let's just make it graphically interesting. So this, this was my solution for that. And um, I don't know, uh, does anyone ha have any more questions about that kind of thing. I'm trying to think. So you know, another great thing to use is map pages, because they're like they're especially Jessica was doing a lot of traveling, and um, her cousin Esmond Romilly had at 16 run away from home and decided he was going to go fight in the Spanish Civil War, and he he made his way across the Channel and rode a bicycle across France and begged a ride on a ship to Spain and joined up with um, with the um, forces the anti-fascist forces there and was one of the few people to survive it it was really horrible and bloody um so but you know i, I love drawing maps i don't know about you but like as a kid uh, when when we had a, i had to draw maps for social studies or geography i'm like you know i grab my colored pencils i'm like yes um so uh illustrated maps are a favorite thing of mine also end papers um, or I'm a freak for end papers. Mimi, I've got a question. How, um, how did you decide how many pages to make this? I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> my uh, drawn and quarterly, my publisher said I had to stop at 300 pages. And um, recently I, I uh, talked to them again and they said I could go over, but the book would cost more. So I'm trying to keep it reined in. I'm at 205 pages right now. Um, this was a fun page to do um, because um, Unity Mitford had um, wrote, written a letter to um, Der Sturmer, um, which was this like virulently uh, anti-Semitic uh, paper in, in Germany, um, just horrible. And she wrote a letter that just said, you know, she just wanted everyone to know she was a Jew hater. And of course, so, you know, the, the word got back in the press because the, the Mitfords were, uh, although they had no money, they were still part of the aristocracy and the newspapers were obsessed with, like the, era, the aristocrats were the, were the celebrities of their day then and were you know, closely covered. So um, their mother said at one point, you know, um, when, when, when it says, Peer's daughter in the headlines. I know it's going to be about one of you, um, and you know their their parents were completely horrified by the, the fact that you know she was get, getting spread all over the news. Not that they weren't anti-Semitic themselves. It it just wasn't you know polite to talk about it. <laughs> so. Amy, there's a, a question in the chat um, yeah. from Ashley says um, a mechanical question. How do you do the white lettering over the dark background? Oh, okay, yeah. Um, well, my son, who's also a very brilliant artist, introduced me to these great um, markers. I mean, you guys, you know how to use computers. You can 
Photoshop and all that, but I use these Japanese pens, the white ink pens that um, mark really well. Also, I have this white ink for finer stuff, um, Higgins, Higgins, mm -hmm. uh, super white mm. with a crow quill pen well a yeah. lot of us are traditional as well as digital yeah. and so yes we would be very much interested in oh. a, a very opaque white yeah that allows us to go over dark this is about the most opaque i've found super white it's higgins super white higgins mm -hmm. super white and make sure you shake it up every time and stir up the dregs off the bottom. <laughs> Can you show us the bottle in the screen? Oh, mm -hmm. Emma, did you not see it here? No. I'm holding Hold it, it up. Hold it's it good. up about forehead level. Oh, there you okay. go. There. Now you can see it. Okay. Nice. Yeah, that's very white. Yes, that's it. Okay. I think everybody here knows Higgins. I, we didn't know they made a super white, and that is good news. Yeah. So, and then the, the beauty of doing it on, on this dark background is that um, if you fuck up, you can just paint over it and start again. Actually, if, if it's still pretty wet, you can kind of just like wipe it off and start over. <laughs> Are you using <laughs> inks or watercolors? I'm using this fantastic um, Dollar Rowney. Um, it's an acrylic ink. It's um, it's Prussian blue, and as you can see, it it gives you a, a really wide variety of um, tones. Um, and I like I kind of went with just one tone, one color again after doing over easy and customer because, um, frankly, it's just easier to make decisions with one tone. They're like if it's full color, you're like I'm like making myself crazy like with panel by panel going, oh, what color is the background? What color should their shirt be? This way, it's just a lot easier. And, you know, um, it's also fun to go like really dark, you know. Uh... <laughs> yeah, uh, Bill, make Very sure right. you get the names of those inks. So when you put them in pen stuff, so everybody can see the names and brands of those inks, because that's important. Yes. Do you use any special pens? I heard you say something about pens. Um, well, not, I mean, I, I use crow quills and I ordered a bunch of different pen points from places like jet pens, different Japanese nibs, and just, I don't know what they are. I just sort of play with them all. You know, Can you talk a, a little about the cartoons on your walls behind you? Oh, those are the pages. Um, ah. They're, they're, um, they're, just, they're, uh, copies I printed off uh, at 65%. So they're not, the, the actual size is eight by 10. Each page is eight by 10. And these are like s reduced to 65%. And it's just so I can keep track of it. I mean, I can look at it on the computer. I have scanned everything in, um, but it's, it's you know, I, I got all these cork boards from like uh, buy nothing or offer up or Amazon marketplace for like, you know, five bucks, 10 bucks each. Never pay full retail people. <laughs> you probably know that you're a cartoonist. What am I talking about? Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm going to have to start. Um, actually, I'll uh, let me unplug the computer for a second. I can take you around the room. So, wow. Let's see. It goes from like oh way my over goodness. here all the way around. Oh my. To now I'm on the back wall and I'm that far. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's it. 
There might be um, a few questions kind of um, embedded in this, but I, I know that um, Over Easy was just under um, 300 pages. Um, does that, how, how long does it take you or did it take you to do that project versus this one? And oh, is, endurance, is endurance something that you ever have to deal with, like in terms of just keeping on with such a, what seems like a, a large project, at least to, to me? Well, uh, uh, Over Easy and the sequel Customer is Always Wrong were actually, it's just one story and it's a, um, it was a very different process than, than this book now because I had initially written it as a conventional piece of fiction and my agent couldn't sell it. And I had done that because I thought like a uh, graphic novel, that's crazy. No one could do a graphic novel that long. That's nuts. I could never do that. And this is when my, ch you know, from the time my children were like in preschool and, and first grade, uh, up until uh, they were in both in elementary school and middle school. And I finally like broke down and admitted to myself that this is what it wanted to be. And then it took me much longer because I still had two children at home. So I was like constantly interrupted and I, you know, I couldn't like, I couldn't really keep, keep in a groove for very long. You know, it takes, sometimes it takes you like days just to like get in a groove and like get to a place where your mind is clear and you can see what you're doing. And I, I was constantly interrupted. So it, you know, it took like between, I want to say 2000, 2009 to, to 2014 to, to do over easy. And then <laughs> customer, which is even longer, took like, you know, three years to do, two and a half years to do because my kids were in college. And now I was like, you know, I had all my, I had my life back. So um, also the difference is that with, with those two books is that it, it was a story that I had like internalized for so long and I knew exactly what it looked like in my head. I knew exactly what every panel should look like. Um, so that made it a lot easier um, in some ways to, to put it out on the page with, with the Mitford book. I like just said, I want to do a book about the Mitfords. And it's like, what does it look like? And I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> and then, like I said, I just started looking at all these images and getting inspired and, and eventually worked up a style. It also took me a while to like, because there's six, you know how it is with families and, and, resemblances between siblings like they they kind of look e like each other and sometimes they look almost like each other but you have to like really look at them hard to realize <laughs> what the differences are and how to stylize that in a way that so that people can see that so there was that issue as well um, of making them distinguishable from one another and and also they they just happen to have this very distinctive uh, extremely wide space between their eyes where they're like this huge, I don't know what you like, uh, the bridge of the nose is just gigantic. It's like starts here and it goes down and it's like super big and flat. And then their eyes are deep set. <laughs> it's a really distinctive thing. Actually, what I can tell you is one thing that helped me was this Ed Sorrell, um, book cover for another book by Jessica Mitford, where I, like he helped me crack the code on how to, to draw Jessica, who's probably the weirdest looking of them all. Yeah, this is a, a picture of her in middle age. You can see that, see that giant space between her eyes up at the bridge <laughs> of her nose. It's just very distinctive. So sometimes actually it, it does help because um, Caricature is something I've really just come to in later in life. I always said, oh, I don't do that. I can't do that. That's not my strong suit. But then you're like, you know, after a while, you're like, come on, you gotta, you gotta give it a try. And it helps to look at other people's caricatures just so that you can like, just see how other people have like stripped it down. I mean, it doesn't mean you have to copy them exactly. You can just see, you know, like crack that code, you know? Thank you. In case you guys didn't get it, this is our latest issue of Pen Stuff. It's a very nice picture of Mimi. Where, oh, that's Donna's drawing. Here's Mimi. Yeah. Uh, 
Very nice. And inside we've got our cartoons from our people who send us cartoons. Right. So anyway, um, I was I was just thinking about the fact that like you so sometimes you're doing these single images that are really strong and emotional and other times it's just fun to give into like base cartoon instincts um, where um, you know, you, you take like a, a classic cartoon trope. Um, this, this page, for example, um, Jessica and her, her uh, cousin Esmond Romilly were in Spain and their, her family found out about it. And, and they actually had uh, Anthony Eden, who was like the secretary of the Navy or something, uh, send a battleship to pick her up and bring her back to Britain. And uh, actually the, the battleship was there to pick up S Spanish Civil War refugees, but they also said, you know, yeah, bring her back. And the, the captain of the ship met her on the shore and tried to lure her on the ship with, with um, delicious food. And she and her and, and uh, Esmond had been um, living on, you know, like just the like rice and beans. It, it was, you know, the it was wartime Spain and there was very little in the way of food. And he's saying, oh, won't you please join us on board for lunch? And she's like, oh, I'm, I'm afraid I can't. She'd been subsisting on wartime rations of garbanzo beans and rice. We've got roast chicken with bread sauce, mashed potatoes and peas and chocolate cake for dessert. And all of a sudden she's, she's imagining him as a roast chicken. And then of course, there's the old, and all that sort of thing. And then she's like, re comes to her senses, poof. Oh, I just have the awful feeling you lock me up and take me back home. What a ghastly idea. I give you my word as an Englishman. Decca wasn't buying it. So it's fun to like go back and forth between, you know, silly stuff like that and, and uh, other, you know, images that are just all about emotional power. Mimi, how did you get so good at lettering? Well, I have been lettering since I was a kid. My dad was an amateur sign painter. He, he, he worked uh, in San Diego. He worked for General Dy Dynamics Convair as a, basically as a skilled blue collar worker there. Uh, but he took uh, a sign painting class at San Diego City College. And I was like, I don't know, 10 or 11 or something. And he had all these like sign painting books and lettering books and I got interested in it. So I, you know, I started like really early with that. And, um, and I, you know, created this font for this book specifically because I, I just thought a, a sans serif regular lettering font um, was not really, uh, cutting it as far as the, you know, the style. So this seemed to work better. So um, I find it actually very relaxing. It's like the least of everything I do. It's like when I'm lettering, all I have to do is think to think is think about writing, making letters, letter by letter, you know, and I listen to Baroque music on YouTube. <laughs> And it's very soothing. <laughs> Everything else is hard. That's easy. Do you do them in pencil? I have to throw it out. Oh, oh yeah, pencil. Oh, uh, yeah, I pencil it first. I'm, I'm not that. I'm not that good. I'm no Chris Ware. <laughs> I was going to point out your use of perfidious Albion, which is of course the great Nazi insult against the English, which is particularly funny in this. I think it predates the Nazis, though. Really? Yeah. The it's yeah. like well they picked it up they used it on them it fits in beautifully and actually it was it, it was uh uh nancy mitford's husband's idea to try to lure her on a ship with with food <laughs> this is great and then uh, there you know you can like this is after after unity uh, shot herself the story of what happened and um, that was really fun to do 
and like I said, you know, if there's, if there's, if you make a mistake, you can just kind of wipe it off and because the ink's acrylic. So you're like working on this kind of plasticky surface at this point with the ink on the paper and, and you can just wipe it away. <laughs> and, you know, if it's, if it's really messed up, you can just put more ink down and start again. So there's that. Silhouettes always fun. Amy, do you use a special type of paper? Uh, this is, it's uh, just uh, Arches 90 pound watercolor paper. It's another map page. Scotland, of course, had to be plaid, like because it has to be, you know. So yeah, the the Mitfords they had. I'm still trying to figure out. I'm I've got I've got feelers out to, to try to figure out why they had enough money to even have this many homes, even as he was spending them into the ground. And all that we saw that. Any other questions? I have a, you've probably been asked this a million times, but how did you come to write the first episode of The Simpsons? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, my husband Wayne was working on Pee Wee's Playhouse with Gary Panner, and he introduced us to Matt Groening. Uh, who was at that point living in a literal literal shack in Venice when Venice was a um, still like a ghetto in Venice, California. And um, so we became friends with Matt and then, you know, Matt, things started to escalate for Matt and suddenly had the series and he was asking his cartoonist friends if they wanted to write an episode. And I was the only one who didn't say, oh, TV, poo poo. <laughs> I said, yeah, hell yeah, I'll do it. And, and um, I did it and uh, I went to a re one rewrite meeting uh, on the Fox lot and the um, Sam Simon was the showrunner and Mike Reese and Al Jean were two guys who I had known from the, from the National Lampoon when I worked there who were, uh, you know, the, the only other two writers and, and Matt at that point when the show was just getting started. And basically, uh, I didn't learn until years late. I, I, so I wrote the episode and it got, it wound up being the first episode because they were behind in their schedule and it was Christmas time and it was a Christmas episode. So they decided to run that one. And then I was not asked to be on staff and no one ever you know, Matt never said anything, called me or said, I'm sorry, or like, it's not happening. And years went by, I was like, oh, maybe I'm just not good enough. And then like, finally, you know, 15 years later, I learned that Sam Simon's going through a divorce and he doesn't want any women on staff. So, you know, and you could do that then. I mean, and, and later, you know, when, when my agent tried to put me up for things, they'd say, oh, we already have a woman. Like there could only, there could just be one, you know. Um, and uh, so I got thrown off the moving gravy train. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm sure they hired plenty of people after that who were as talented or less talented than I was. You know, it, 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 was, a, it was a fuck job and um, Matt has never apologized. And, um, you know, my life would have been really different. I can't say it would have been better. It would have been different. And I would just would have been a lot richer. <laughs> So, um, but then, you know, I got to uh, achieve my goal of writing these two books about uh, a restaurant that I worked at. It was very, very close to my heart. And I don't know if I would have been able to do that if I'd continued working in television. Oh, thank you. I had no idea that, that uh, you were screwed like that. <laughs> yes. Yes, and I'm the turd in the punch bowl because no one wants to hear anything bad about the Simpsons, you know. And and people are like, oh, but but I'm like, yeah, that's me. I'm I'm the I'm the one to ruin the Simpsons for you. <laughs> I'm the joy kill. Well, they should invite you back. I think. 
yeah, well, good luck. <laughs> that could be your next book. Nah. <laughs> I don't even like this. I like King of the Hill better. Actually, I like the time. I love King of the Hill. I've always loved King of the Hill. I think it just has a lot more nuance in terms of the characters. Mimi, can you talk about um, any um, reading like comics influences from when you were younger or? Oh. Everything from Peanuts to um, Archie to um, uh, 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 Pfeiffer, Jules Pfeiffer was like huge because his, my, I think my parents had Sick, Sick, Sick. And I was like, you know, I hadn't, I hadn't seen anyone do comics like that that seemed to be specifically for adults. And, and I thought, yeah, that's what I want to do. And, you know, you're, you're, a, I, 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 girl and you have right a uh, drawing talent and people go say well you can illustrate children's books like that's all you could do because you're a girl and I was like I, you know and for a, a while as a kid I thought when I was a kid and I was reading children's books I thought that would be a good thing to do but then I grew up and I was like I don't really want to do that you know and it's like people want to put you in a box and say oh you could do this because you're a girl you could be a teacher you could be a nurse you could draw pretty pictures for children and I was like no I don't want to draw I want to draw ugly pictures for adults <laughs> so uh yeah but for, of course of course Kurtzman and the early Mads my dad had the the trade paperback collections of the EC Mads and you know I was like reading them at six and seven so I was reading like starchy and and all that brilliant twisted stuff. And, and then of course, all the mad magazines through the sixties, um, that was like, you know, that was our communist manifesto. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, Crom, all the underground stuff like Crom was a big influence. Um, and um, yeah. And you know the, the lampoon stuff, Sherry Flanick and Mary Kay Brown. I, I really love that stuff. Really nice. Do you have any uh, projects past this one in mind, or is this enough for now? Because it oh. looks like massive. Oh, this is enough for now. <laughs> <laughs> I don't yeah I don't know what's next honestly it sounds like your muse definitely is in charge yeah yeah and I'm uh, I I'm I'm I, you know I'm just thrilled because I I'm 65 years old and I feel like my work's just now getting better like I'm like on a daily basis getting better which is something that you don't really hear people talk about that much at this age. But I do, I feel like my work's getting stronger and my graphic design sense is getting better. Everything is improving. Um, and I, I can't help but say that I have the, you know, the pandemic to thank for that because, you know, there's, there's nothing like being forced to sit down and work. There's nothing else to do, you know? I mean, pretty much if you, all you're doing is sitting at your desk with a pence, pencil in your hand. It's you're more likely to get work done with that scenario than if you're out dicking around. You know, <laughs> it's just the way it goes. Like you're like eventually it's you know it's like the the monkeys with typewriters. Eventually something's gonna happen. <laughs> Well, this has been, um, Zoom has been terribly, you know, the various kind of media like this have been very helpful for us uh, as artists because we can sit here in Seattle and areas like, or all over the world and listen to somebody from Los Angeles or France or anything. And uh, from the safety of our own homes and just enjoy their wonderful presentations like uh, the inimitable presentation you put on tonight. Well, thank you. Yes, I agree. This is a great presentation. Um, I'm sorry, I'm, uh, my camera isn't working, but um, I, I wanted to know if you ever uh, uh, tour, do lectures. Yeah, you know, in, <laughs> in regular, 
in the in the regular world if that ever comes back yes so you know it um because i i don't know what the current state of the whole supply chain blah blah is at this point um a, a few months ago drawn and quarterly told me that it would take 18 months from the time i turned in my book to having a finished book in in my hands so i'm i'm hopeful that um you know, in 2023 or 2024, this will, the world will be back to some kind of normal and I can go on, do a book tour. Yay. <laughs> take a look at what we got here. So Mimi, I teach comics and whenever I teach a unit on creating a sense of place i always show over easy because oh, nice. you drew that diner so lovingly um i can draw that that's my comfort zone i can draw that diner in my sleep there's other things i i hate to draw like cars and and cityscapes because you're like oh all that architecture and mm. you know, car just right and <laughs> stuff like that but the the diner no that was that was easy. Did you take photos of it or was it in your memory? No, I, I have I, I have many, many pictures of it, but as many pictures as I had of it, I um there's still there was always some angle from which I had not shot it that I had to figure out how to shoot it, how to, to do it. So, you know, um you just have to like run with it. It's, you know, same with like, I always say this, um, drawing things that you don't like to draw um, is you have to learn, you have to find a way to draw it. You have to find a comfort zone in which to draw those things you hate to draw so that, you know, it still looks like your style and it doesn't look like you hated every second of it. I, I have a problem with sometimes getting too mechanical and it looks like an architectural drawing. Yeah, um, yeah. And sometimes I just put away the rulers. Yeah, you have to do that sometimes. Or, yeah, I found mm -hmm. the same thing. And just make a shaky line. <laughs> and I spent comics, some time it, it learning to be draw cars recently and that was fun. <laughs> Yeah, I still have trouble with cars. Mm. They're 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 hard. Yeah. Between that and horses, but at least you can trace cars. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I had to, I had to figure out how to uh, how to draw it. Uh, how to, first of all, I had to like find a, a convincingly, uh, ooh, uh, a destroyer. Um, that from that era and then like i was like oh fuck me destroyer jesus <laughs> guns oh <laughs> also i i um did this it's wonderful oh well thanks i i i was saying that i i learned everything i know about drawing uh, bombers from fourth grade boys <laughs> This whole work just sparkles. Well, thanks. It's amazing. Thanks. And, you know, and other times you're like, like how much detail do you want to put into this thing? Like sometimes it, sometimes you, you like get really ornate and other times it's just like, you know, boom, three panels, three heads. And then in the last one, like she's, uh, Diana um, and Oswald eventually, after after uh, Britain declared war on Germany, the uh, British intelligence had been following them for a long time, and they they mm. put them both into prison under a wartime act that where they just could throw you into prison without a trial, uh, just because they thought you uh, might be a danger to the country, and mm. uh, and she went she was in prison and for like five months with two very small children at home and they they questioned her to see like they're like looking for any excuse to to let her out but 
she was just doubling down like nobody's business. Um, and so they, they kept her in prison for three years. Oh my God. Where she deserved to be. <laughs> Maybe she was happy. <laughs> she wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> She she lived to she she was an unrepentant fascist to the end of her days. She lived to be ninety something, and she would just never give it up. And if you go on YouTube and and see interviews with her late in life, she's just like still doubling down, man. It's amazing. And she's the J.K. Rowling of fascism. Yeah, yeah. And and actually, J.K. Rowling was was a, a Mitford fan and named her daughter Jessica after Jessica. And I'm like, what happened to you? <laughs> um, but if you, I would, I would, if you're interested in the Mitfords, I would uh, urge you to seek that out because their their upper class accent is unparalleled, ridiculous. It's it's so upper class. It's just absurd. And Nancy, uh, who was the the writer was doing war work in London. Um, she did everything from like, they put her to work um, writing names on the foreheads of people who were dead or almost dead in morgues <clears throat> from the, the blitz, from the bombing. Like she had to write on their forehead who they were in marker, you know, like with a Sharpie. And um, she also um, was a fire watcher because during the blitz they had citizens uh, were had to go out and watch for fires that were were starting from all these bombs that the Germans were dropping relentlessly, and, and then she, they asked her to to speak to new new volunteers about being a fire watcher, and after the first time she did it, they said, you know, you don't have to do that anymore. And she's like, why why not? She says, people hate the way you talk. They want to put you on the fire. <laughs> So it's, uh, and there's just so much, there, there's, they were just so funny, all of them, even, even Diana, um, they had a brilliant, brilliant senses of humor. Oh my God. Were you inspired by the Trump years to go into this subject yeah, matter? Yeah, it's very similar, actually, yeah. Amazing. Anybody else got any more questions? <laughs> this was this was an amazing presentation, Mimi. Oh, I have been watching what you've been doing, and I thought I have got to get her as a speaker for Cartoonist Northwest. And I am really happy that this all came together and that everyone was able to enjoy your incredible presentation. Well, thanks. It's always so much easier to talk to other cartoonists. <laughs> I'm curious, I mean, I'm so impressed by the pages on your wall, and I think I'm I'm on my third graphic novel, and I'm still every time reinventing how you proceed and organize and actually finish a graphic novel. Do you have some organizational tips for those of us here who or thinking of a big project or in a big project? Well, I mean, these cork boards have, have been very helpful to me. Um, my This is my son's old room and I really, I only just moved into it in like um, fall of 2019. Um, I Before that I'd been working in this, um, it was literally like a, a Harry Potter space under the stairs in the basement where it was like just tiny and uh, so I had no way of doing anything like this. So this was, uh, moving in here was a, a big, big step step up for me. Um, I mean, the room had been empty for years. He's, he's almost 30 years old, but for some reason, I just didn't um, think of reclaiming it until uh, till then. Um, I mean, it's just, it's, I've, I, you know, I've scanned everything. So everything's in a file so that I can like, like look at it on my computer and see the way it paces there too. Um, 
it's also that's helpful because sometimes something from a previous page will suggest what should come next what what you know like the obvious choice of what should come next um it, you know it starts to talk to you in that way um and tell you what to do sometimes um in fact this page here where it talks about um where is it um Oh the, um, oh, the previous page is like the, at the bottom, it says, if the Germans thought they were the kings of doubling down, they were only just neck and neck with Diana. And then the page after that, I realized um, what I had to say that it was to be fair that is doubling down was a distinctive uh, family trait in the, with the Mitfords. They, they all doubled down. That's what they did. They're like, oh yeah. <laughs> so um oh my yeah so the next page is where uh jessica is now in she's in the united states and it's a flashback back to to december of 1939 when she just learns that unity has suffered a gunshot wound and she doesn't know anything more than that but the newspapers are coming after her and asking her for interviews and ironically Jessica and Unity being uh, utterly opposite poles politically were, were um, each other's favorite sisters and remain so for the rest of, of their lives. And she, she couldn't explain it to anyone, especially to her husband, the, the militant anti-fascist. He was like, no way he could understand it, but they had a, this bond and she, they offered her you know, huge sums of money for an interview about her sister. And she and her husband were struggling and just very, very poor, but she said no. So, I mean, that's your double down. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, you know, it, it, if you like really start to, to examine, like, listen, listen to what you're doing and realize there's, there's ways of making leaps to the next thing. Um, also, I, I um, strongly advise thinking about it in the middle of the night. <laughs> that helps. <laughs> it really does, though. I'm a lifelong insomniac, so I do that all the time. <laughs> Yeah, uh, miraculously, I'm able to to remember what what I think about in the middle of the night about this, which I've never been able to do before. Because usually, you know, middle of the night, you wake up, you go, "That's a brilliant idea," and the next day, you're like, "What?" But in this case, I'm sorry. I guess I'm just so like focused on it. Another similar question, do you kind of outline and thumbnail the whole thing? Not, not with this one. I did with, with the other two books, but this is just like, I've never ever worked this way before. And I always thumbnail like with the, the web comics and the previous comics I've always done, I've always done thumbnails, um, you know, like, especially like when working for, for publications where an editor wants to see it, uh, you know, when, Remember when there were your editors? Does anyone remember editors? <laughs> there used to be editors. Um, and editors actually are a wonderful thing. And I've worked with some really wonderful editors who have given me a tremendous education in, um, in stripping things down. Um, that's another point actually, is that, um, and this is, I see this as a big problem with a lot of people doing, uh, comics on computers and working with computerized fonts is there's way too many words. And the thing about, about um, you know, doing, doing a, a drawing, this is extremely scribbly, but um, if you draw it on a, a thumbnail or a, a sketch, um, you start to realize as you're writing it, this is too many words. I, I'm trying to jam too much stuff into this. I've got to like go back, 
write it more simply, just simplify, strip it, strip it, strip it down to the essence. Like you don't need that many words. You can like just rewrite it on a piece of scrap paper over and over until it gets shorter. You know, I mean, you're often not thinking of the best way to put it in the shortest way when you first write it down. So you have to like just winnow it, winnow the words down because no one wants to read that many words in a comic. That's the whole thing about it. It's a it's a graphic art. It's not, you know, no one wants to read a bunch of of tiny handwritten words like, I, you know, I'm sorry, but uh, uh, Chester, uh, what's his name? No, not, uh, not Chester, uh, the, the guy that- Chester Toronto, Brown. Chester Brown, too many, too many words. <laughs> too many tiny handwritten words, just no. Um, I forget what else I was talking about, but uh, it, it's a great exercise in, in restraining yourself. My dog is barking. Oh boy, can you hang on or are we done? I, unless anybody has any more questions, probably at the breaking point. Anybody? I think so. Well, anyway, thank you so much, Mimi. Well, thank yeah, you. thanks a lot. It was, that was great. Amazing. Thank Fabulous. you. Fabulous. Such a privilege. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Oh, you're welcome. It was fun. No. All the best with completing the work. Oh, thanks a lot. Wait, can't wait to buy it. <laughs> I can't wait to finish it. Okay. <laughs> All right, guys. Good night. Thanks a lot. Good night. Thank you. Yeah. Well, anyway, thanks everybody for coming. And remember, uh, come uh, go over to if you have a comic you want to share, go over to our comic group and put it on our best of the Northwest thread. We can't wait to see it. Uh, anyway, again, thank you so much, and I hope everybody has a great evening. Thanks, Bill. No problem. Thank you.